Hey, it's Jamie, host of podcast Murderish and Dirty Money Moves. Join me on March 5th, 2023, as I present The Heiress Who Hustled Hollywood, the true story of Hollywood scammer Mary Carol McDonald. It's a twisted tale of schemes, mysterious death, homicide. There's even a link to Michael Jackson. This is a worldwide digital experience you can watch from anywhere. I'm releasing never-before-seen photos and telling the story from my own first-hand account, having lived through part of this ordeal. Get your tickets now at moment.co slash murderish. That's M-O-M-E-N-T dot C-O slash murderish. Hey everyone, it's Jamie. Today, I'm re-releasing an episode of Murderish, covering a bizarre case that had a connection to a popular pizza chain. In December of 1985, a series of heinous crimes took place in two different states, leaving three people dead. The murders all had a strange connection to Domino's Pizza. One of the murder victims would name his killer in a dying declaration. And then, the hunt was on to find the serial murderer. The opinions expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect those of the Murderish podcast. Sensitive topics are discussed. Listener discretion is advised. The case I'm covering today involves discussions of childhood sexual abuse and suicide. Please use discretion and take care before listening. In December of 1985, a series of heinous crimes took place in two different states, leaving three people dead. The murders all had a strange connection to a popular pizza chain. One of the murder victims would name his killer in a dying declaration. And then the hunt was on to find the killer. Join me as I walk you through the case widely known as the Domino's Pizza Murders. takes us to Hanahan, South Carolina, and Glendale, California. Hanahan, a suburb of Charleston, has a significant military presence and it's considered by some to be one of the most desirable places to live in South Carolina. Families flock to the town to enroll their children in the highly rated public schools. Glendale, California, located about eight miles south of downtown Los Angeles, is the fourth largest city in L.A. County. The city is widely known for its significant Armenian-American population. Actor Paul Walker and supermodel Kathy Ireland were both born in Glendale. In the late 1970s, however, the city would be terrorized by two serial killers known as the Hillside Stranglers because most of their victims were discovered in hills surrounding the Glendale area. In 1985, Glendale would again make headlines for the case we're examining today. Shortly after 2 o'clock in the morning on December 4th of 1985, a man walked into a local police station in Hanahan, South Carolina. The man, identified as 24-year-old Gary Melke, had a telephone cord wound tightly around his wrists and he was bleeding from his head, neck, eyelid, and mouth. Police quickly called paramedics, who transported Melke to an area hospital. While being transported, Melky begged EMT George Pledger not to let him die, saying, Please don't let me die. I feel like I'm going to die. Doctors determined that Melky had suffered gunshot wounds to his temple, the back of his neck, the base of his skull, and his jaw. Melky was fully conscious and alert during the ambulance ride to the hospital, which lasted about eight minutes. He remained alert for another 12 hours while receiving treatment in the hospital. Unfortunately, Melky's condition worsened and he slipped into a coma. Gary Melky succumbed to his injuries and died five days after he was admitted to the hospital. Before he died, however, Melky described to police and EMTs what happened to him and he named his attacker. As soon as Melky arrived at the police station, He told police and EMTs that he and his co-worker, 24-year-old Chris Zur, 
were working at a local Domino's Pizza restaurant in Hanahan during the late evening hours the night before. Melky, who was the assistant manager, told police that he and Zur, a delivery driver, had been shot by a man and left for dead. Somehow, Melky was able to drive himself to the police station after being shot and strangled. Melky gave police the name of the man who shot him and his co-worker, and he was quickly transported to a local hospital. Meanwhile, police drove to the Domino's Pizza restaurant where Melky and Zur had been working the night before. They needed to find Melky's co-worker, Chris Zur, who'd also been shot, according to Melky. When police arrived at the Domino's Pizza restaurant, they saw Chris Zur lying on the ground with a single gunshot wound to his head. Zur had been shot execution style, but he wasn't as fortunate as Melky. Chris Zur died immediately after being shot in the head. With the name and description of the attacker provided by Melky before he died, Investigators in Hanahan, South Carolina, immediately began looking for their primary suspect. Unbeknownst to them, the suspect was already on his way to California, where he'd commit another murder just six days later, and he wasn't traveling alone. During the late evening on December 9th of 1985, Corey Spiroff and Edmund Sycam were nearing the end of their shift at a Domino's Pizza restaurant in Glendale, California. Both men took a job at the pizza chain to supplement their military incomes. Around 11.45 p.m., a man and a woman walked into the restaurant. Sykem asked the man, can I help you? At which time, the man pulled out a gun and said, yes, you may, with a smile on his face. Spiroff told the man that John Harrigan, their co-worker, who was a delivery driver, would soon be returning to the restaurant. Harrigan had left to make a pizza delivery not long before the man and the woman walked in to rob them. When Spiroff told the man that Harrigan would be back soon, the man took off his jacket to reveal that he was wearing the delivery driver, John Harrigan's, Domino's Pizza shirt and name tag. Then, the man said chillingly, no, I don't think so. At this point, Corey Spiroff and Edmund Sycam must have known something went terribly wrong during Harrigan's pizza delivery. The man then made Spiroff and Sycam turn and face the wall, and then he pulled out his gun. This was likely going to be the point at which the man would shoot and kill the two Domino's pizza workers, just like he had in South Carolina, just days before, unbeknownst to them. With Spiroff and Sycam facing the wall, and the man holding a gun in his hand, something happened that would change the course of events that evening. A co-worker named Richard Wagner walked into the front entrance of the restaurant. He was there to bring some furniture to Spiroff. At this point, the man told Spiroff to go up front and deal with the person who just walked into the restaurant. When Spiroff greeted Wagner in the front of the store, Wagner tried to go behind the counter. But Spiroff stopped him and told him to wait in his car and he'd bring the pizza order out to him when it was ready. When Wagner went back to his car where his wife was waiting, he told her that something was off about his encounter with Spiroff and that he suspected they may be getting robbed. Spiroff, who worked with Wagner, had just acted like he didn't know him. At that point, Wagner and his wife left the restaurant. After Wagner left, the man wearing John Harrigan's work shirt and name badge ordered Spiroff and Sycam to go into the commercial-sized freezer where the temperature was about 32 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The man then tied both men up using a telephone cord, binding their wrists behind their backs. What he did next must have absolutely terrified the two Domino's Pizza workers. The man put the telephone cord over a food rack located above their heads, and then he wrapped it around their necks like a pulley, hanging Spiroff and Sycam from the food rack. At this point, Spiroff told the man that he was in pain, to which the man replied, Shut up, at least you're alive. The man walked over to the restaurant's safe and stole over $1,000. He told his female companion to wipe down the areas where fingerprints might be found, and she complied. Before leaving, the man asked Spiroff when the restaurant would reopen and Spiroff told him the store would open again at 11 a.m. the following day. The man responded by saying that he'd be in San Francisco by then. Knowing the man had done something to his delivery driver, John Harrigan, 
Spiroff asked the man about Harrigan's whereabouts. The man told Spiroff that Harrigan would be found in a motel. At approximately 12.15 in the morning, the man and woman left after being in the restaurant for about 30 minutes. Just 15 minutes after the man and the woman left, police arrived and untied the two men, who'd been standing on their tippy toes to avoid being hanged. As it turned out, Wagner, the co-worker who stopped by to drop off some furniture to Spiroff, knew something was wrong when Spiroff pretended not to know him. Picking up on the clue, Wagner immediately called the Domino store manager from a nearby payphone. This was before cell phones. The store manager then called police. If Wagner hadn't stopped by that night, or hadn't picked up on Spiroff's clues, it's frightening to think of what the two men's fate would have been. Spiroff would later say that he passed out a few times while he was hanging in the freezer. He lost his footing trying to kick some boxes toward himself and Psycam so they could stand on them and avoid being hanged. They were lucky to have survived the ordeal. After Spiroff and Psycam were rescued, the hunt was on to find their co-worker, 21-year-old John Harrigan. Back in South Carolina, police knew the name of the man who'd shot and killed Gary Melky and Chris Zur while they were working at Domino's Pizza, and they were actively looking for him. They didn't know at the time that the killer had left the state and traveled west to California. Six days after Melky and Zur were shot in Hanahan, South Carolina, Corey Spiroff and Edmund Sycam were hanged and left in a freezer in Glendale, California. But the two cases weren't linked together right away. Back in Glendale, police were able to retrieve the address where Harrigan went to deliver a pizza. By searching the Domino's Pizza database, police discovered that Harrigan had gone to a nearby motel room to deliver pizza on the evening that Spiroff and Sycam were attacked and robbed. With the address in hand, Glendale police headed to the motel room where pizza was ordered. Several hours after the robbery and attack, Police entered room number 205 at the Regalodge Motel on Colorado Boulevard in Glendale. Upon entering the room, police immediately saw that the water in the bathroom was running. As they entered the bathroom, they saw a body in the bathtub. It was John Harrigan. Harrigan's head was located directly under the water spout, and his hands and feet had been tied behind his back. A washcloth had been used to gag him. Rope was used to tie a pillowcase around Harrigan's neck. 21-year-old John Harrigan was pronounced dead at the scene. Upon further investigation in the motel room, police saw that the telephone cord in the room had been severed. They also noticed that Harrigan's car keys and wallet were missing. It was apparent to police that the motel room had been wiped down and cleaned. Even so, they were able to pull two fingerprints from the crime scene. A thumbprint was found inside of a cardboard toilet paper roll. Another print was found inside of the motel room telephone book. The print found inside of the phone book was lifted from a page for pizza establishments. Investigators eventually found John Harrigan's vehicle about 30 miles away from the crime scene. Inside of his truck, investigators found Harrigan's Domino's Pizza name tag and work shirt. At the time, police weren't certain of Harrigan's cause of death but a forensic pathologist would later clarify. Investigators at the motel room crime scene noticed that the type of knot used to bind John Harrigan was the same type of knot used to bind Corey Spiroff and Edmund Sycam in the freezer. Dr. Joseph Kogan, a forensic pathologist, later determined that John Harrigan was killed by ligature strangulation. Dr. Kogan came to this conclusion due to the depth of the depression caused by the ligature as well as the multiple hemorrhages found in Harrigan's inner eyelids. Autopsy findings indicated that Harrigan lived no longer than 10 minutes after the ligature was placed around his neck. Drowning could not be ruled out, according to Dr. Kogan, given that Harrigan was found fully submerged underwater with a gag in his mouth. Dr. Kogan noted the presence of frothy pulmonary edema in his trachea and bronchi. Once the fingerprints from the motel room were processed, police in California were able to link them to a man who'd previously served time in the military. Once Glendale police matched the fingerprints to a name, it was quickly uncovered that their suspect was the same man who'd been named by Gary Melke before he died. Now law enforcement agencies in both states knew their cases were connected 
and the hunt was on to find their suspect. A photo of the primary suspect was made public, and this would prove to be a good move. Someone recognized the man in the photo and alerted law enforcement as to where they could find the man. The tipster said that the man was staying at a hotel in Las Vegas. Police quickly went to the Las Vegas hotel, and when police located the suspect, he calmly said to them, I'm Mitchell Carlton Sims. He then turned his back to police with his hands behind his back. Sims was not alone in the hotel. With him was 20-year-old Ruby Paget, Sims' girlfriend and alleged accomplice in the Glendale crimes. Both suspects were arrested at the Vegas Hotel, which they'd been staying at under assumed names for two weeks. Mitchell Carlton Sims was an average-looking Caucasian man with curly brown hair, an average build, and a weak chin. Sims, in his mid-twenties at the time of his arrest, was married to a woman named Teresa, with whom he had children. Sims had previously worked as a manager and a driver at Domino's Pizza in South Carolina. He and victim Gary Melky were co-workers, which is why Melky was able to name Sims after he and Chris Zur were shot. Sims' mother, Mildred, married his father in the 1950s when she was just 15 years old. When Sims was six months old, His parents divorced because his father had gotten a young girl pregnant. After his parents divorced, Sims' father was mostly absent from his life. He only saw him about two or three times during his childhood. As he got older, Sims, the youngest of three children, often referred to himself as a human ashtray, as he would put cigarettes out on himself as a form of self-mutilation. Sims' childhood was extremely dysfunctional and abusive. The horrific and shocking details of what he endured would come out during trial. Prior to his crime spree, Sims had been in the military, but he was dishonorably discharged after having an affair with a woman of higher rank and making comments about killing her husband. At some point during his marriage to Teresa, Sims began having another affair with a female co-worker at Domino's Pizza, which caused he and his wife to split up. Sims eventually ended the affair with his co-worker, and he and Teresa got back together. Sims, however, would eventually meet another woman named Ruby Paget, and the two of them began having an affair. Sims left his wife for Paget. He and Paget did drugs together, and Sims saw Paget as everything his wife wasn't. Then, on Christmas Day of 1985, the two lovers were arrested at a Las Vegas hotel on murder charges for the Domino's Pizza murders. In March of 1987, almost a year and a half after police caught up with Sims and Paget, Mitchell Sims went on trial in Pasadena Superior Court. Sims, 26 years old by this time, was charged with first-degree murder for the brutal killing of 21-year-old John Harrigan. A special circumstance charge of lying in wait was also added, which made Sims eligible for the death penalty. In addition, Sims was charged with two counts of robbery and attempted murder for his crimes against Corey Spiroff and Edmund Sycam, who were left hanging in a freezer. Judge Jack So presided over the trial, which lasted nearly three months. In his opening statements, Deputy District Attorney Terry Green told jurors that the crimes were motivated by money and sadistic pleasure of committing crimes. He said that Sims and Paget coldly calculated Harrigan's murder as they lured him to their motel room by ordering a pizza. Green told the jury that Sims' crimes were partially motivated by a grudge he held against his former employer. Green said that Sims began working for Domino's Pizza in South Carolina in March of 1984. At some point, he enrolled in a management training program and was eventually promoted to manager in January of 1985. A few months later, according to Green, Sims became angry after he received a bonus check that was much less than he believed he deserved. In May of 1985, Sims wrote a resignation letter and sent it to Domino's Pizza headquarters in Michigan. After receiving no response to his resignation letter, Green claimed that Sims sought revenge against a particular Domino's Pizza employee named David Lippman who Sims believed was responsible for the meager bonus he received. 
In November of 1985, six months after sending a resignation letter to headquarters, Sims began working as a delivery driver for Domino's Pizza in Hanahan. Although Sims never harmed David Littman, he went on a murder spree directing his anger at Domino's Pizza employees in South Carolina and California. Although Green pointed out to jurors that Sims' motive for the crimes in Glendale stemmed from his grudge against a former co-worker in South Carolina, jurors never got to hear details about the South Carolina murders. Judge So wouldn't allow those details to come out during the California trial. Once the trial concluded, however, the jury were invited into the judge's chambers where he provided them with information that wasn't allowed during trial. This is when jurors first heard details of the South Carolina murders. From the start of Sims' trial, the evidence presented was emotionally heavy. In the beginning of the trial, the prosecution played for the jury a 17-minute video which was recorded and narrated by the head detective in John Harrigan's murder case, John Perkins. In the video, Perkins walks through the crime scene and narrates various aspects of it. The video included footage of officials from the coroner's office pulling Harrigan's lifeless body out of the motel bathtub. By the time his body was taken out of the bathtub, Harrigan had been dead for several hours. Jurors saw officials remove the pillowcase from Harrigan's head. John Harrigan's mother was present in court every day and had to endure graphic video footage of her son's body being pulled out of the bathtub. As the video was played in court, Sims glanced at John Harrigan's mother and smiled. During the trial, the jury was taken to motel room number 205, where John Harrigan's body was found. I spoke with one of the jurors on Sims' trial and she indicated that it seemed highly unlikely that Sims acted alone in Harrigan's murder. The juror, named Jolinda, told me that the bathtub was very small. Given Mitchell Sims' size, she didn't think that he could lift Harrigan's body and place him in the bathtub without help from Ruby Paget. Edmund Sycam, one of the victims who was left hanging in a freezer, testified that Sims and Paget walked into Domino's Pizza in Glendale around 11.45 p.m. After walking in, Sycam asked, Can I help you? At which time Sims pulled out a gun and said, Yes, you may, with a smile on his face. DDA Green told jurors during trial that on the day that Sims and Paget were arrested in Las Vegas, Sims said to Detective Perkins, I had to kill that boy, referring to John Harrigan although this statement was not recorded. Sims' defense attorney, Morton Bornstein, wasn't claiming that Sims had not played a role in the crimes. Rather, he based his defense of Sims around the claim that Sims didn't mean to kill Harrigan. Bornstein claimed that Harrigan may have still been alive when Sims and Paget left him in the bathtub. Bornstein theorized that Harrigan may have struggled to free himself from the bindings, at which time, he could have hit his head on the bathtub spout, which could have caused him to pass out and eventually drown. Dr. William Vickery had interviewed and assessed Mitchell Sims' mental health prior to trial. Vickery, who testified for the defense, said that Sims had low self-esteem and felt shame and humiliation stemming from his childhood abuse. Vickery said that Sims had long believed that he was inadequate and that people who have suffered verbal and physical abuse often grow up to exhibit violent and abusive behavior as adults. Sims' mental illness and depression were confirmed by the doctor, as well as drug and alcohol abuse. Mitchell Sims' trial concluded in May of 1985, and the jury began deliberating. From the start, the jury all seemed to be on the same page. In less than a day, the jury was ready to render their verdict. Mitchell Sims was found guilty of first-degree murder and lying in wait for John Harrigan, as well as two counts of robbery and attempted murder for Corey Spiroff and Edmund Sycam. Next, the jury would have to decide on Sims' sentence, which could be death by gas chamber. Sims' mother, Mildred, took the stand during the sentencing phase of her son's trial. Her testimony described in detail the unspeakable abuse Sims suffered as a child at the hands of her husband. Mildred told jurors that Sims' stepfather, Arnold Cranford, forced her son to engage in oral sex with him and also forced Mitchell Sims 
to engage in sex with her, his own mother. Mildred told jurors that Cranford raped her son when he was just seven years old and forced him to begin having sex with her when Sims was 16 years old. She said that Cranford also forced Sims to engage in sex with his older sister, Merlin, who also testified at the sentencing hearing and corroborated everything her mother said. During her testimony, Sims' sister, Merlin, told jurors that she suffered abuse at the hands of her stepfather for years and that he impregnated her. Merlin became suicidal as a result of the horrific abuse and attempted suicide by taking drugs and even shooting herself. Sim's stepsister, Margaret, testified that one day she was almost abused by Cranford, but her stepbrother, Mitchell Sims, saved her by calling the police, who arrested their stepfather. Cranford was merely placed on probation after his arrest. Mitchell Sims' brother, Eddie, testified that he witnessed Cranford sexually assaulting his brother and also heard Cranford engaging in sex with Sims' stepsister, Margaret. Just like his sister, Eddie became suicidal, but said his brother, Mitchell, was able to talk him through it and help him cope. Sims' mother and siblings all said on the stand that despite the horrific abuse he suffered, Sims was a good father. Sims' wife, Teresa, testified that Sims was depressed and felt worthless from the guilt he felt as a result of being forced to engage in sex with his own mother. At one point during the hearing, Sims' mother, Mildred, became overwrought with emotion. As she was sobbing, Sims looked at his mother and then glanced at a reporter and laughed. According to Jolinda, the juror with whom I interviewed, Sims' mother and stepfather deserved to be in prison right along with Sims for the horrific child abuse that took place at their hands. On September 11th of 1987, the jury sentenced Mitchell Sims to die in the gas chamber. Judge So was in agreement with the jury's decision, saying at the time there was no other just and fair punishment. After his trial in California was over, Sims was extradited to South Carolina to stand trial for murdering Gary Melke and Chris Zur at Domino's Pizza in Hanahan. A jury convicted Sims of murdering Melke and Zur, and after his conviction, Gary Melke's family told WCTI-TV that they would travel to California in order to see Sims put to death in the gas chamber. After his South Carolina trial concluded, Sims was sent back to California to serve out his sentences. Ruby Paget went on trial before Mitchell Sims, and a jury convicted her of first-degree murder and robbery for her part in the crimes against John Harrigan. She was also convicted of robbery for the crime that took place at the Domino's Pizza in Glendale, California. Paget was acquitted on the attempted murder charges for Corey Spiroff and Edmund Sykam. During her seven-week trial, Paget said she was not a willing participant in the crimes. Instead, she claimed that she only observed the crimes unwillingly. She claimed that Sims abused her and she did as she was told under threats of violence if she didn't comply. Paget had been interviewed by Dr. Nancy Kaser Boyd, a domestic violence expert, who concluded that Paget did suffer from child abuse and battered women syndrome. During Paget's trial, DDA Terry Green claimed that Paget was lying about her involvement, as it would have been impossible for Sims to gag Harrigan and place him inside of the bathtub by himself. During Paget's trial, Green also zeroed in on the fact that her statements during trial were different from what she told police during interrogations. During interrogations, Paget told police that she was inside the bathroom when Sims drowned John Harrigan. At trial, however, Paget was claiming that she never stepped foot inside the motel bathroom. During trial, Paget recounted what happened to John Harrigan when he arrived at their motel room to deliver the pizza. Paget said that as soon as Harrigan arrived, Mitchell Sims opened the door and kneed him. Paget said that John Harrigan was afraid during the attack and asked them, Are you going to shoot me? Are you going to blow me away? According to Paget, Sims had a gun on him but thought it would make too much noise if he used it. So, according to Paget, Sims opted to gag Harrigan and then put a pillowcase over his head. Paget said that Sims then put Harrigan inside of the bathtub, which he began to fill with water. He then submerged Harrigan under the water. 
The two of them then left the motel room and headed to the Domino's Pizza restaurant in Harrigan's vehicle. Although Paget claimed not to be a willing participant and that she was basically forced to go along with the crimes, a jury ultimately convicted her of first-degree murder after seven days spent deliberating. Ruby Paget wept as the verdict was read. She was later sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. It's been said that Mitchell Sims has given his life over to God since going to prison. As of the current date, Mitchell Sims has exhausted all of his appeals and is eligible for execution. That said, in March of 2019, Governor Gavin Newsom placed a moratorium or a temporary hold on capital punishment in California. At the time he announced the moratorium, 737 inmates on death row in California were given a reprieve, and Mitchell Sims was one of them. According to Newsom, his decision to put capital punishment on hold was motivated by the high costs, racial disparities, and the application of capital punishment in cases where the defendant was wrongfully convicted. Newsom has publicly questioned whether we, as a society, have the right to end a life. Prior to the moratorium going into effect in 2006, California put a hold on all lethal injections due to claims that those who were being executed experienced pain and suffering. Since then, L.A. District Attorney Steve Cooley has fought to continue executions using a one-drug method, which is currently used in Arizona, Ohio, and Washington. In 2012, 15 years after Sims was sentenced to die in the gas chamber, Cooley filed a request to put Sims to death using the one-drug method. As of the current date, however, Mitchell Sims still resides on death row in San Quentin State Prison in California. Ruby Paget currently resides in a women's prison in Corona, California. It's been reported that Paget has stayed out of trouble in prison and actively takes part in self-help workshops in order to better understand the poor choices she made, which landed her in prison. More than 30 years after he was left to die in a freezer at Domino's Pizza, Corey Spiroff is still employed by a food company that owns Domino's Pizza. Only now, Spiroff is a high-ranking executive and resides in Saudi Arabia. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Murderish. Head over to the Murderish Facebook discussion group where we can talk about this case. You can also find me on Twitter at MurderishPod or on Instagram at MurderishPodcast. If you like the show, please hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening now and tell a friend about Murderish. If you feel like it, you can leave the show a rating and review in your favorite podcast listening app. Buying products and services advertised on the show is another great way to support it make sure to use my special URL or promo code. Head over to Murderish.com if you'd like more info about the show and me. On the website, you can also sign up to support the show through Patreon and have some of your dollars donated to the Cold Case Investigative Research Institute. There's also a link to buy Murderish t-shirts and other merch. That's Murderish.com. Murderish is mixed and mastered by John Buchanis of Audio Editing Solutions. Music by Nico of We Talk of Dreams. This episode was researched by Tiffany Williams and written by me. In order to tell true crime stories on this show, information is gathered from various sources, including but not limited to news articles, newspaper archives, blogs, social media, TV productions, police reports, court records, books, magazine articles, direct interviews, and more. I recognize that oftentimes someone before me put in a lot of time and effort to gather information I draw from to tell these stories. Thank you to those individuals for their hard work. Sources for this episode include Patricia Klein and Stephanie O'Neill at Los Angeles Times, Glenn Smith at postandcourier.com, Case Law Vlex, Justia US Law, cityofhanahan.com, murderpedia.org, Veronica Rocha at LA Times, Glendale News Press, Michael D. Harris at UPI Archives, Anne Kane at Business Insider, Oxygen Snapped Killer Couples, and a direct interview with Jolinda, who was a juror on Mitchell Sims' trial in 1987. 
Thank you so much, Jalinda, for your insight on this case and for your service on the trial. As always, Ishers, thank you for joining me on another episode of Murderish. And remember, listening to this podcast doesn't make you a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish. Hi, guys. I'm Jesse Prey. And I'm Andy Cassette. We're the hosts of the podcast Love Murder, a weekly true crime podcast about love gone fatally wrong. This show is all about seemingly normal people driven to terrible madness by passion and rage. If you love twisted trysts, sordid swings, and murderously bad romance, listen to Love Murder on the iHeart app, on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.